وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول Number 10 The 10th act of ibadah that the Salaf rahimahumullah used to come with and that is العمل وترك الجدال They used to come with a lot of actions and they used to avoid argumentation. The Salaf rahimahumullah, the idea of arguing and debating, that wasn't what they liked. They loved to just act upon what they knew and implement what their knowledge taught them. That's it. But we, we learn something, we want to argue it straight away. It shows that we've learned it for others. And that we didn't learn it for ourselves. And what that is the objectives of knowledge is to implement what you learnt. That's why the poet he said, فَلْتَقْسِدُوا أَرْبَعَةً قَبْلَ ابْتِدَى تَعَلَّمْ لِكَيْ تَفُوزَ بِالْهُدَى أَوَّلُهَا الْخُرُوجُ مِنْ ضَلَالِ وَالثَّانِي نَفْعُ خَلْقِ ذِي الْجَلَالِ وَثَالِثُ الْإِحْيَاءِ لِلْعُلُومِ وَالرَّابِعُ الْعَمَلِ لِلْمَعْلُومِ Those are the four objectives of knowledge. So the first reason for knowledge is what? To take yourself out of darkness. You're doing it for yourself, no one else, yourself, لنفسك. The first reason why you're gaining knowledge is to take yourself out of the, the darkness of misguidance and take yourself to the light of guidance. So the Salaf, they learned knowledge for themselves. They didn't learn it for people. So Fulan can see you to be a person of great understanding or to prove your point to somebody. And this generally happens. As students of knowledge, we had times in our lives that we saw where we would learn a mas'ala and we would learn it to prove someone wrong. May Allah forgive us for that. And the Salaf, rahimahullah, some of them mentioned that. تَعَلَّمْنَا الْعِلْمَ لِغَيْرِ اللَّهِ فَأَبَى أَنْ يَكُونَ إِلَّا لِلَّهِ We sought knowledge for other than Allah, but their knowledge refused with Allah's permission, subhanahu wa ta'ala, except that he brought us to guidance or he brought us to uh, sincerity. Abdullah ibn Mubarak, pointing this issue out of learning knowledge to implement it and not to argue, he said, إذا أراد الله بعبد خيرا If Allah wants good for a person فتح له باب العمل Allah opens the door of implementation for you وأغلق عنه باب الجدل And Allah closes from that person the door of argumentation, disputation from that individual Ponder here If you want to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants good for you Look at your actions and how you are when it comes to the knowledge you learnt. And if you want to uh, see if you're a person Allah Taala didn't want good for or did want good for, see how you are when it comes to argumentations. Some of my great, some of my teachers that taught me and I learned knowledge from, who I believe were knowledgeable people, very knowledgeable. Their understanding of the religion was very deep, and what they've read is far greater than what many of us have seen. You see? مَعَذَلِكَ They will never argue with anyone. They never ever entertain the idea of arguing with people. They would look and they would leave. And that's something Imam Malik rahimahullah did. A man came up to him and he said to him, uh, can I discuss an issue with you? Or can I, have an, can I argue with you on an issue? Imam Malik said, what about if uh, you beat me in the argument. What do you want from me? He said, I want you to follow me. He said, okay. What about if I win? The man said, uh, uh, if you win, then I will follow you. Saying to him, Imam Malik. He said, what about if a third person came and he beat both of us? What do you want? And then he said, we both have to follow him. And then Imam Malik said, you, your religion is jumping from one to another. You're jumping from Whoever wins, that's your religion. And my religion is certainty. I know what's right from what is wrong. I am upon certainty in my religion. You are someone who's in a state of doubt. Go to someone who's doubtful like you and argue with them. Why did he say this? Please, this point you have to read, understand Imam Malik is thinking. Just because someone won an argumentation or a debate doesn't mean they are right. Someone is, they know the art of debating, they know tactics. 
they know uh, sophistry, they know how to trick the opponent, they know how to make the people see him to be the knowledgeable one, the wiser one. And so debate and knowledge is not always hand in hand. Yes, there are some people who are very good debaters. There were people who are very good at uh, debating and they also have great knowledge. They have great knowledge. They were ulama. They were good, uh, they were good at debating. From the people who are like that was Shaykh Islam Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala. No one debated him except that he always made them look like, uh, uh, like he knew nothing. But not everybody was like that. Not everybody was like that. So basing your religion on debates and argumentation and going on YouTube and looking at this and looking at that, focus on actions, my beloved brothers and sisters. And you don't waste your time on that. Especially nowadays, some people's da'wah and their method of da'wah has become based on just debates. That's all they do. They wake up and they, they have a particular day in the week and a particular location uh, and they go there and they debate, they put that content online and they leave. And that's da'wah for them. And the Salaf al-Salih, the pious predecessors, uh, those same people, if you look at their actions and their ibadat and their amal, is very low. The Salaf, rahimahullah, as you can see, Abdullah ibn Mubarak and others, their religion wasn't like that. Their religion was what? Their religion was al-amal, actions and debates. Only when the necessity calls for it. When it's necessary for them to debate. So please take that on board. Um, if you learn one word in the religion, implement it. Yani whatever you read, read it for yourself. Yani read it for you to implement it first and foremost. You come across adhkar, memorize it and implement it in your life. You come across uh, halal and haram in issues, Make sure that you, f f you do the halal and you stay away from the haram. You learn issues of fiqh regarding your salah, your tahara, your zakat, your sawm, your hajj. Implement it straight away. Don't think about, oh yeah, this inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to show my friend that he was wrong. Or this issue, I I'm going to teach my local community. First of all, worry about yourself. Have I implemented this? Have I taken this on board? How can I incorporate this into my life? How does it fit into my life? This is the thinking process that you should have regarding the knowledge that you gain and that which you learn. And that is an advice first and foremost to myself as my mouth is closer to my ears than yours. Number 11, husn al istima How the Salaf were when it came to listening. That's an act of obedience. To listen is an act of obedience depending on what you're listening to. Listening to the Qur'an is an action of obedience. The Salaf, they had a unique, unique method and ways of listening. Ata ibn Abi Rabah, it was said about him, كَانَ إِذَا حَدَّثَهُ أَحَدٌ If someone told him, someone spoke to him, بِحَدِيثٍ وَهُوَ يَعْلَمُ And he told him about a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu And he knew it. Ata knew the hadith, memorized it, knew the chains for it, knew the, uh, the ins and the outs regarding the hadith. He knew the fiqh and the uh, knowledge inside it. If he knew it, and someone was to tell him the hadith, يُصْغِي إِلَيْهِ He will bring his ear close to that person. Ata ibn Abi Rabah. يعني Ata ibn Abi Rabah, do you know who he was? Ata ibn Abi Rabah was the successor after Abdullah ibn Abbas in the Haram. Yani Abdullah ibn Abbas when he died, the person who occupied the seat of Abdullah ibn Abbas in the Haram to give fatwa was Ata ibn Abi Rabah. Right after him. Ponder. Think here. Ata ibn Abi Rabah sat in the Haram as the Mufti after Abdullah ibn Abbas passed away. And yani Ata ibn Abi Rabah used to be a slave he was a black slave, Ata was black, and he was a slave, and he, he's the, a slave for a woman in Mecca. She saw how dedicated and hungry he was for knowledge. And she said, you know what, you, I, I can't keep you as a slave, because you're someone, if I let go, you can bring something to this ummah. You see, she was a wise woman, she, she let him go, she freed him. He went, he sought knowledge, he used to live in the Haram, and he used to learn from Abdullah ibn Abbas, he became an Imam. يشار إليه بالبنان يشار 
ilayhi bil banan that he used to point at him in his knowledge and his understanding do you remember the the uh, imam that I uh, the khalifa to the amir al mu'minin that I spoke about sulaiman ibn abdul malik sulaiman ibn abdul malik used to come to the halaqa of ata ibn abi rabah and sit down and listen to his lecture and ask him questions related to hajj and issues of fiqh the leader of the muslims would ask ata ibn abi rabah يعني عطاء بن أبي رباح was a jabal, was a mountain in knowledge and in fiqh and in hadith and in tafsir and all of that. If a person came to him and asked him about a hadith, وهو يعلمه and he knew that hadith, يصغي إليه he would give his heart and mind to that person. He would listen attentively to that person. كأنه ما سمعه like he's never heard it before. Why would he do that? لألا يخجل المحدث so he doesn't make the person who's narrating the hadith, feel khajal, shamed and embarrassed. He didn't. He would say, okay, the Prophet said that. Huh? I'll make the person feel like he's telling hadith to Atta ibn Abi Rabah. Yani, this is how they were. And this reminds me of something that happened to me. Something that happened to me. One of my teachers one time, he, uh, uh, we had a gathering, we were sitting somewhere. And uh, I uh, quoted an imam, and I misquoted who it was. Yani the quote was right, but the person who I ascribed the statement to was the wrong person. So I don't know how it was. Was the statement an Imam Ibn Taymiyyah's statement, and then it, uh, did I attribute it to Ibn Taymiyyah, but it was actually an Imam Dhabi, or was I attributing it to Dhabi, and it was Ibn Taymiyyah? I don't know which, which, which was which. But anyways, it was the statement and I attributed it to the wrong person. And my sheikh was there. And he was listening to me. And the feeling I had, I was very young. The feeling I had was I taught my sheikh something. You know, when you, you're young, you're, you're energetic, you learn something, you think, you know, you can benefit everybody. So he listened to me. He nodded his head. And I remember, subhanAllah, the way he listened to me. As soon as I finished, he said, Allahu Akbar. He was amazed, you know, like he gave me that feeling that he was amazed with what I was saying. And I'm young. I was about 18, 17. He then said to me, I came across the same quote, but from another imam. And he was correcting me. He didn't say to me, that's wrong. He didn't say that. So-and-so said it. He said, I came across the same quote, but from another imam. I remembered that I was wrong. As soon as he said that, I was like, Sheikh, you're right, right. It wasn't the Imam that I mentioned. It was the one you just mentioned. Yani the way he even corrected me was, it took me back, it blew me. Till today I remember it. So from there I learned, brothers, husnul istima, listening to someone, giving them your ear, and also not making people have a feeling of shame when they talk to you. Ma yata'allaqo bisant. Inshallah ta'ala, point number 12, I'm going to speak about how the Salaf were when it came to be, being silent and not talking. This itself was something they could give us a lesson in. Something we can take from them and we can benefit from them. Their silence. Uhayb ibn al-Ward, rahimahullah, he said, Al-Hikmatu Asharatu Ajza'a. Wisdom is ten parts. Nine of those parts, he said, it's in what? Nine of them is silence. Ani. Wisdom, hikmah. Allah did not say, يُؤْتِ الْحِكْمَةَ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَمَنْ يُؤْتَ الْحِكْمَةَ فَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا Did Allah not say, say that in the Quran? Allah said, He gives wisdom to whoever He wills. And whoever Allah gives them wisdom, then He's truly been given what? A lot of khair. That's what Allah mentions in the ayah. So, wisdom... If you have it, you have a lot of khayr. Uhayb ibn al-Wardi is saying to you, hikmah, wisdom, is what? Ten types. Nine of those types is a samt, silence. Not talking. He also said, Inna al-abda la yasmutu. A person is silent at times. Fayajtami'u lahu lubbuh. Fayajtami'u lahu lubbuh. And he, his thoughts gather together. A person, when he's silent, 
and he doesn't talk, he can gather his thoughts. And he can come with wise statements. How many times have you felt you were at a particular place? You were in a discussion with someone. You didn't go quiet. Whenever they said something, you responded. They said something, you responded. But you went home and you're like, oh, I could have said that. Oh, I could have, I, why did I not say this? Why are you feeling this way right now? Is because you're silent. You were quiet. You thought about it. You gathered your thoughts. Remember that statement always. Inna al-abda la yasmutu. A person when he goes quiet, Your thoughts, your, your gems comes out hata, when you're silent. All the hikmah that you would have said, it will only come out when you go quiet. When someone talks, just wait and then respond. Wait and respond. Internalize their question. Even at times ask them and say, can you repeat that question again? Can you repeat that question again? Just so you end up hearing the question in clarity, with clarity, and your answers, inshallah ta'ala, you think about it. Ba'd the salaf some of the pious predecessors, they used to say, As-samtu ibadah. Ah, look at this. Silence is a ibadah. Min ghayri ana'in. But it's a ibadah without any tiredness or fatigue or energy that you have to exert. Imagine that. It's a ibadah. Just by being silent and not saying anything, they're saying it's a ibadah. But it's an ibadah, you're not, you're not moving, you're not running, you're not getting tired, you're not getting fatigued, you're not exerting efforts, nothing. Just be quiet. وَزِينَةٌ مِنْ غَيْرِ حُلِي And it's also a beauty without having to adorn yourself. And you know, when you speak, you have to adorn yourself with words. You have to speak in a particular way. Yeah, indeed, you know, this, that, you know, eloquent words you need to use. No. Silence is a beauty without you saying anything, without you exerting any effort, without even you trying to beautify yourself. Silence beautifies a person. وَهَيْبَةٌ مِنْ غَيْرِ سُلْطَانٍ and it brings about veneration without enforcing it onto people. When you talk, you're kind of enforcing on others to respect you. But when you're silent, you are getting respected without you enforcing on them. And it's also what? It's a fortress without any walls. And it's also... Relaxation, it's comfort, it's ease for the angels that are writing. You're not making them put effort and hard work in writing everything that you're saying. Because the angels are writing everything you're saying. No. It's easy for them. They don't have to write anything. And it suffices you from having to make excuses for yourself later. Silence suffices you from that. How many times have you said something and then you have to come back and make a statement out of it and apologize and this and that? And the ulama, they used to say, your tongue, you control it when you don't speak. And it controls you when you speak. The scholars, they also said that Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, he imprisoned the tongue between the teeth. It's in prison. The tongue is in prison. If you open it, you're letting him out. And we all know the famous hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, that when the person wakes up every morning, every morning that you wake up, when you get out of bed, that uh, your tongue, your whole entire body talks to your tongue. And then it says to the tongue, اتق الله فينا في الله in our affairs فإن استقمت استقمنا وإن وجدت وجدنا Tongue, fear Allah in us. If you are steadfast, we're steadfast with you. And if you are crooked, and you do wrong, we're going to do wrong with you. What does that mean? It means that you don't end up fighting with someone and going into a physical fight unless there were some statements or speeches that were said to each other. صح? The fist follows up. The fist comes after uh, in an altercation between two people after one person had said something. So keep that in mind. Assalamu alaikum. If you're enjoying these videos and you'd like to keep up to date with all of the courses we're going to be running, make sure you head over to amauathome.com.